right, hey everybody. Welcome to the end of day two now for DEF CON. Um, thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, we're just gonna have a conversation about current uh, state of security in Ethereum. Um, we're gonna do about 25, 20, 25 minutes of questions here and then we'll, we'll take some questions from the crowd. Um, so uh, first I guess maybe we'll introduce ourselves if you guys wanna go down the line. Um, just say who you are and uh, what, you're, what you're doing. All right. Um, I'm Martin Holstenswende, and I work as the security lead for the Ethereum Foundation, and uh, also work at uh, Geth Development. I'm Phil Dian. I'm at Cornell University in IC3. I'm a PhD student working on smart contract security. Hey, I'm Matthew DeFrante. I'm the founder of DK Labs, a Ethereum-focused auditing firm, and also a cartographer. I, you know, by implementation, I do a few cryptography related things on the side. Um, I'm Morellian, a uh, founding member of Consensus Diligence and a smart contract auditor. Hey, I'm Dan Guido, the co-founder and CEO of Trail of Bits, a software security research development firm. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, so we're gonna start it off with a softball. Um, what's the biggest change in Ethereum security in the last year? Uh, so, I'll take it first. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I think there's been a couple of things I've noticed. Uh, the first is that the Solidity compiler itself is a little bit less on fire today than it was a year ago. Uh, there are certain patterns that we had implemented in our own static analysis tools that have been deprecated because the compiler uh, now checks for those issues. Things like uh, the constructor being the same name as the contract and having divergences of those two uh, allowing you to exploit you know, un uninitialized uh, contracts and, and, and variables within them. Um, another thing that I think is pretty unique is that uh, a lot of the less serious people have dropped out of the community. So the post-ICO kind of uh, field of people that are left now are a lot more serious about developing applications that work. Um, and I think that shift in culture, <laughs> thanks. That shift in culture has led to much better code. Um, and the last thing is I think that today we have substantially better tools so that if you care to write good code, you can. Uh, things from, you know, my company, Slither, Banticore, Echidna, things from everyone else on this uh, panel of experts here have demonstrably improved the code that I've seen from our clients. Oh. Yeah, so I was going to say that uh, a year ago when we were in Mexico, uh, there wasn't much of a security community, and that's something which I feel has really taken off in the last maybe half a year. And most of the people who were interested in, in security came from the Ethereum space and, and really were Ethereum enthusi enthusiasts who were also interested in security. And now I think we've seen a kind of large influx from traditional security into this space. Uh, and that really changes things. Yeah, to speak to what, uh, what uh, Martin just said, um, uh, sort of recently I attended an academic conference, uh, Usenix 18, and they had actually an entire session on smart contract security, which had I think around four talks that were Ethereum related. And that's a community that's completely outside of this space. Those are people who normally would not be working on these tools. Um, so definitely a lot of outside people have come in. And we've also seen sort of the people who are already in the space start producing artifacts. So we've seen the first set of formally verified contracts. We've seen smoother processes for like engaging that. Um, and just a lot of improvement across the board. I think kind of everything is a little bit less on fire than it was a year or two ago. So still on, they've stopped adding tires to the fire. Yeah, it's still on fire, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think sort of you know echo what everyone else has said. Um, I think really like uh, not only has the security uh, community um, grown, there's been massive increased awareness in security issues. I think you know like most exchanges now require a security audit of some sort before they you know interact with products, which is you know surprisingly, sh shockingly, that wasn't the case always, right? Um, the like there is more awareness uh, generally that you know, before you go live, you do need a security audit. Um, there's like that. There, there's the best best practices that need to be followed. Um, so like you know we're playing a bit less fast and loose and and more that more realizing that you know if you write a smart contract, um, you know that may hold even if you don't intend it to many millions of dollars and you know you don't want to be 
directly or indirectly responsible for a loss of that. Um, it's hard to go after all of these guys and have something original to say. Um, so tools, this, it's been an explosion and I just want to like call out like Zeppelin, um, chain security, Trail of Bits really like coming on hard in the last year has, has really like stepped everybody's game up. Um, and then like Bernard and Mithril within consensus are kind of going crazy um, in a good fun way. Uh, and then I think like maybe the thing that I've heard more conversation about recently is uh, like the awareness of incentives and uh, how crypto economic mechanisms themselves can actually uh, contribute to security uh, in like one way is just like automated deterministic uh, non-subjective bounties that pay out when you break the thing. I think that's amazing. Cool. Uh, so next one, um, compared to securing traditional systems, how do the economic properties of smart contracts change how you approach their security? Okay, well, um, so I'll, I'm gonna, like, I, what I think is one way that we're tackling that is actually through actually creating like incentives for coordination within the security community. So our Panvala project is uh, a set of incentives that bring people together, uh, developers, um, auditors, to try to establish clarity around what is a safe contract to use. Um, and if you're interested in that, we recently put out a video of the process for, for seeking consensus around that. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet it after and we'd love to get your feedback on it. And I. We have got some already, and I'm looking forward to more. Who's, who's, uh, here you go, Matt. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, like, uh, one of the big distinctions is the uh, irreversibility and the transparency of the smart contract environment versus the, you know, like, traditional security domain. Um, kind of, you can kind of usually treat traditional security almost like insurance, you know. It, it's, like, often less costly to just fix the issue after the fact than to prepare for it. Um, or, you know, you have like safeguards or abilities that you just don't have um, in smart contracts where, you know, if somebody drains their contract, I mean, it's over, there's, there's no recourse. So, and I think like it's, uh, it's a, a lot of people say, hey, look, you know, uh, smart contracts are just never gonna work because look at all the exploits that have happened. But uh, I don't think it's a smart contract thing. I think it's, well, of course, yes, it's a new space and it's a bit hard to, uh, have a good security framework in such a nascent space, but um, I think this is a problem that exists in all software, and it's just far more clear in the smart contract space. Um, and, and damages are irreversible, so it's more—it's not that you know smart contracts are necessarily hard; they're hard in a different way. But I would say that the level of difficulty is, is similar to other domains. It's just that it, if you're bad, if you don't do your due diligence, you don't, you don't follow the right process, there is no hiding behind, you know, like a, a firewall or a closed garden. There's no, oh, I'll report it if I have to. It's just there for the world. And so all mistakes are very clear. Uh, so it seems like there's more, but, you know, like there's, banks have lost far more than smart contracts to the date. To date. Yeah, so I think for me, uh, economics sort of has a dual nature here. Uh, in one way, it's very helpful in securing these systems. So something like just knowing the value of the system you're securing is not something that you can do in sort of classical systems, like what is the value of a, of a power plant's uh, ethernet system, or what is the value of uh, an election system for a county or something like that. Um, so it makes some kinds of security analyses much easier. On the other hand, because a lot of the security assumptions we have to make to show that these systems are secure are themselves economic, it also sort of brings security into this realm of economics, which is much more subjective and nebulous, where like even two economists might not agree on basic definitions or, or basic principles. So I think we're going to see a, a lot of subjective security sort of develop as the space starts to differentiate itself from traditional systems. And uh, I, I kind of look forward to that. Um, also, on a personal note, uh, the, the, the economic nature of these systems kind of keeps me up at night. So I don't know about you guys, but when I'm doing an audit, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that um, a lot more than, yeah, it, motivating, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of, of really what you should, you should be awake at night because of that. Because, I mean, if you come from, from traditional IT security, you try and find vulnerabilities and you might find, I don't know, like cross-site scripting, uh, some SQL injection, some data leakage. You can take money even maybe sometimes from one account and do something. But the stakes are so much higher here and it's like 
someone can randomly make a contract which all of a sudden has millions of dollars and um, we, <laughs> we need to kind of realize that the stakes are so much higher so, so easily in this system which just natively deals with currency stuff. Okay. I'll keep my answer brief. I think the one citable anecdote to back up Phil's point is this bank chain bug that came out just a few weeks ago where the blog post described, hey, we didn't do an audit of this because it would have cost more than the value held in the contract itself. Uh, that's not something you can really do with a classical system. And I totally agree with Phil's point there that this is something completely unique about the field that we're in. Um, so I think that's the, the biggest difference I could point to. Yeah, cool. Uh, and so actually, Dan, we were having this conversation the other day about uh, bug bounties um, and whether they're uh, a good practice and, or um, using tools to find uh, repeatable bugs. Uh, do you want to launch into that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think the concept of bug bounties makes sense if all you get, if all you want to get from an auditor is a list of bugs. If that's all you're expecting to receive from hiring anybody on stage here to review your project as a list of bugs, then sure, a bug bounty makes sense. I wouldn't think that any of us expect to only provide that as a service. Um, second really big issue here, and, and really you should be upset if you've hired someone like one of us up here and that's all you get. That's, that's not the service that you should get in order to end up eventually getting secure code. The second thing is you don't know how to measure the output of having that bug bounty. So what did you receive? Like, did enough people look at it? How much code coverage was gained? Uh, did they inspect it for the issues you actually care about? You have no idea. Um, a lot of this has to do with just a lack of talent in the industry. Like, people at Trail of Bits have done bug bounties before, and the way that we do it is we spend about 10 minutes to just scan over the code by hand, run our Slither static analyzer on it, and if it doesn't find anything, we move on. The smartest people in the space are not doing bug bounties because we have better things, more impactful things to do to improve the ecosystem itself, like build tools and do research, than to spend it all on bug bounties. So I think that a lot of people in the community have been misled about the efficacy of what bug bounties actually can accomplish. So if you re really need security guidance, you really should be talking to a smart human that can reason about security properties of your system, and the bug bounty thing is just a secondary kind of cover your ass type type deal, which sure, you could have, you could not have, but it's not the first place you start, and it, it doesn't cover nearly as many bases as people think it does. Yeah. I agree. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay. Um. I'll, sure, I'll go. And uh, yeah, no, I, I agree that the efficacy of bug bounties is dubious in certain circumstances. I think like if you have, like the contract is the bug bounty in a lot of cases, right? If you have a monetary compensation for being ethical, that's like, uh, you know, an auxiliary incentive. Like if, if really the people who have, who go around looking at contracts and, and testing if they're vulnerable, uh, you know, randomly, generally those are also, unless you're like, you know, unless you're one of those hacker one types, those are not the people who are going to report the bug bounty to you. There's like many, there's many other ways to, to profit besides reporting it to the, uh, you know, responsibly to the, to the company. And, um, you know, and like I'd echo the statement that you shouldn't really just be uh, looking for uh, lists of bugs or vulnerabilities, like how many vulnerabilities did this guy find? It shouldn't be the metric for a quality security audit. It should be, how, are we informed now to make better decisions in the future? Has our, have we gotten comments on improving our process such that you know, we, we don't make fragile code, we don't get into bad situations in the future? Um, I think realistically, uh, both in this industry and outside, if possible, it's always best to hire a security person internally, right? Like someone should be with you every step of the way. Security is not like a, an afterthought. It's not like a thing at the end of the process. It's part of the process of creating software. And really, in the blockchain space, uh, you know, it's, this is very evident. But I hope that, you know, like even the traditional industry starts to think more this way. <clears throat> So I agree with most of what's been said so far. I do think uh, Dan was maybe a little too, too negative on bug bounties. Um, so the way I see bug bounties is that it's obviously not a, a sort of substitute for doing your homework. So it's your job as a, as a company to ensure that you hire the right people to have input into your code, that you hire external people as well as yourselves, that you run security processes and engage in critical review of your software, that you understand the limitations of the people you're hiring, because while all of us are competent security professionals, we're humans who have like a certain amount of hours in the day and we all focus on different aspects of security. 
Um, so it's your, your job to ensure you hire a diversity of opinions and skill sets to sort of inform you about how to proceed with your code. But at the same time, if you don't have a bug bounty, you're, you're sort of skewing the incentives for anyone who eventually finds a vulnerability in your program. Um, so you want to have something to sort of offer somebody who does find that vulnerability to stop them from just taking it to the chain or something like that. Um, so I think from an economic security uh, perspective, bug bounties are sort of necessary but not sufficient. Just to respond to that, I agree with everything you said. And I think that if you don't have an easy way to report bugs that are discovered in your application after it's been deployed, you're making a huge mistake. Um, we have a little wiki that like talks about some easy things you can do to make it easier to communicate with your project. Um, I believe it's called blockchain security contacts. Uh, so that if any security researcher does find a bug in your code, they can actually communicate it to you. Um, so don't neglect that. Um, but yes, you're completely correct. Yeah, I just echo what Phil said. I'm all for bug bounties, but not exclusive or security work. Yeah, yeah, yeah the same. I mean, I don't think it should be the only security that's done. I mean, there should be like a, a process that um, you know makes your development uh, more more secure. Like, there should be someone in house. There should be a formal audit or three, um, and then there should probably be a bug bounty like across it all. I just think we've been sort of like a false equivalency. There's like, do an audit, don't do a bounty instead of an audit, and then run a, a bounty so that somebody has a reason to report it to you. They're, they're separate things. Right. All right. Uh, next one is, uh, what advice would you give someone who's interested in uh, becoming more involved in smart contract security? Like, where would they start? So my answer to that would be, uh, because that's the way I came into smart contract security, to learn the intricate details and nitty gritty mechanics of the EVM and execution of transaction uh, from the bottom up. That would be my first advice, kind of. We all agree. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely great advice. I would also say look at past security failures and replicate them yourselves. So you should be able to pull off something like the DAO hack. Um, you should be able to understand how to exploit various people's coding error, and you should try it by example. Um, and then once you're sort of done doing that and you feel comfortable that you're at the state of the art, maybe try finding something new. Um, even if it's not a very high severity thing, find something that people haven't thought of yet in some edge case. Um, and whether that takes you three months or six months, sort of at the end of that process, you'll probably know a lot more about the EVM and smart contracts. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both of those statements, uh, especially the intricate details part. Like, most security issues come from misplaced assumptions, right? So you have this black box, and it has a set of properties that you, th like you, that you, you feel comfortable with, um, or that or someone else has told you those are the properties. Um, and like, it's the, the telephone game, right? Like, depending on how far away the person that originally actually you know, made the thing, uh, how many levels there are in between you and that person, like, it's likely that the, your understanding of that black box is twisted. Um, and then you write code that has a bad understanding and misleads the next person. Uh, and then it just you know, builds up over and over, right? So the more you can open black boxes and say, uh, this is how that really works, this is where that interacts, the less prone you are to security mistakes. And also, just try, just try to be a good developer and write anti-fragile code. You know, it, the, the big, one, of the, one of the recent Bitcoin code bugs is a, is a perfect example of that, is when you write a function that seems like it makes a check, um, you know, like the, the name m misleads it into, into making you think that it makes the check, um, like the, the file it's in or whatever. And so somebody will see like, oh, fine, that makes that check and I don't have to check it in the container function. And then you get, you know, infinite money uh, being printed. So be really careful about your assumptions. Just cultivate that mind mindset of awareness. That's how you become good at security. Um, uh, to, ex I guess, take it in a bit different direction. Um, I'd say contribute, uh, like learn by doing. So uh, like participate in bounties, which are like not that bad, we agreed. And um, like run the tools on the contracts before we do so that maybe you'll like get a list of things and make some money and then you'll feel great and then you'll do more. And then you can start contributing to, you know, very, like documentation, um, our best practices would be great or like Dan's not so smart contracts. Um, as well as our uh, smart contract weakness classification registry, uh, like you, you know, and then teach other people. Like that's that's how I would go about doing it, and then show up uh, at these things and ask good questions. 
So I think it kind of depends on what you want to get out of working with the community. Like, are you someone that wants to go uh, like stun hack and flex on Twitter about it? Are you <laughs> a researcher that wants to build tools? Or are you a developer that needs to secure your code? And with each of those different constraints, there's probably a different pathway to learn what you need. I think that each of those starts with two things. And first, to Martin's point, you have to learn the lower level details of all the languages and tools that you're working with. And uh, the second is that you should review what's already been done. Uh, we tried to do our best to make a compendium of that with the awesome Ethereum security list. Just a few links and places where we think people can start off to learn. Uh, but it's really important to keep in mind what your goals are because, um, you know, you want to spend the least time to get the most effort. Cool. Um, so I think we might actually go to the crowd now. Um, if anybody has any questions, we have mics down here on either side of the stage um, if you want to come down. Um, I've got more questions to ask, but I thought I might turn it to you. You want to ask with the mic here? Hi, I was making some notes. Uh, my name is Dmitry, I'm CEO and co-founder of cybersecurity consultant company Haken. Uh, we made about 70 audits uh, for the last uh, nine months, and uh, we are all based in Ukraine. So, uh, what, what's, uh, uh, I made notice that you uh, like uh, were saying that people from traditional uh, cybersecurity companies are entering the industry, yes. Uh, uh, and so I totally agree that the bug bounty is not enough. But the, my uh, comment is that uh, it's like the traditional people, like I, I'm eight years Deloitte, like what we want, we want to have a, a methodology and guideline, like uh, what needs to be done in order to be sure that uh, the audit was done correctly. And uh, uh, I think that this is what is uh, uh, missing so far in this industry. Yes, the weakness classification work is great, but there are still like so many things needs to be done. Like there are two uh, ways how you can do the methodology. It's a principle-based approach, like uh, what are the risks and how to cover them. Or the second is the uh, checklists, uh, what's, what tests needs to be done. So uh, I, my question is like, uh, how do you see what is the right roadmap to create this methodology? Who is leading this process? And like, uh, uh, like I want to underline, I think this is one of the most important thing right now that needs to be done in this industry. Thank you. Sure, I'll field that one. Um, yeah, so uh, we do have a, uh, a community called eSecurity, Security, uh, which is a community that I lead. Um, and out of that, we have a number of working groups. So there's actually um, a working group for developer guidelines, um, and as well as uh, uh, auditor guidelines or assessment guidelines. Um, so the Smart Contract Alliance is one of the groups, um, and Securif is making the developer guidelines. So um, I encourage you to, to reach out and um, get involved in those groups because they are open. Um, if you want to hit me up on Telegram, I can add you to the correct channels. Um, you're in the group? Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, does anybody else have anything else to say anything on, on that? Yeah, so I would caution against trusting any formal like checklist or process too much because the entire sort of point of an attacker in, in, in the security world is that they understand your assumptions and try to violate them. So that checklist could actually lead to sort of blind spots in your process as well. Um, so what I would say is that any sort of halfway competent person you hire to take a look at your contract should sort of know subjectively like as a human being, like where are my blind spots? What have I looked at? What have I not? What state of the art stuff have I done? What state of the art stuff have I not done? And they should actually inform you about that as part of the process. Um, and, and having someone internal who also understands the state of the art could help you with that too. Yeah, sorry. I'd just like to add that uh, I think checklists are great, but they're not for auditors. They're for developers to kind of check while they're writing the code. Uh, but the auditor shouldn't have to you know, rely on those who use those extensively. Yeah, I, I will add those, uh, the developer and, and assessment guidelines are more framework for like, as I enter into the pro, like as a developer, what are the steps I'm gonna go through so that I have a consistent uh, product to, to then hand over to an auditor when they receive it. So it's not just like a bunch of like files. Um, and and on, the, on the assessment side, it's like, okay, what are we going to be delivering um, back to the client um, so that the, the process is a little bit more there's some expectations on, on what you give and receive. Um, somebody else over here? Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you about security in future proof of stake 
actually security of validators. Uh, and uh, because basically the issue is that, uh, let's imagine that I am validator, I will put like uh, 1,000 of Ether in the, my wallet, and I will register the wallet for, for staking, right? I will register with my private key, and what happens if uh, I'm signing block with the same key in the, in the network, and let's say that someone will hack my node, can he actually use the same private key to deregister my node and actually take my stake? Or my question is, how can I secure my stake in the future proposal? I'm trying to find it, but did, did you get it? What? I, I th can I rephrase it? Because I'm not sure, and I'm no proof of stake expert, but uh, what I think you're asking is the same as for proof of authority chains, where the actual ceiling requires the presence of the, of the private key in the node. Yes. And Yes, Actually, that is the case. So, so you will actually have a network node which contains a private key or private secret. Alternatively, uh, can talk to a backend to get uh, something sealed. Or is there actually any solution how to do it? With so those, so like, actually, uh, uh, there is a solution. Uh, that there are different ways to do it. One thing um, uh, is that there's, uh, I've been working like the last year building something called Clay, Clef, it's in the Go Ethereum repo. It's an account management tool which uh, can also do signing for clique blocks, mm -hmm. which is a, a, um, a proof of authority chain type. So there are solutions, uh, but it's not production ready, I guess, yet. So, so from my conversations I've had with the Casper people, and it's kind of hard to nail down because the spec is so constantly evolving, um, it would certainly be possible to have a separate key for signing proof of stake messages than for moving funds. And then essentially what you would do is you would sort of delegate to that key, and that key would put you at risk in the way that it could get your funds slashed if someone misbehaved on your behalf. Uh, but maybe the protocol only allows funds to be slashed so quickly so you can still sort of get some guarantees by maintaining some sort of cold storage. Um, and I'm not sure if that will make it into the final protocol. I think preliminary discussions I've had suggested that it might. It's kind of an engineering detail, but in theory, that's sort of one way to, to mitigate against those risks also. I'll just say that if people have detailed technical questions they'd like to get answered by security experts, they should join some of the communities that Kevin mentioned before. Uh, and then. Uh, Personally, Trail of Bits has open office hours. We run every other week where people can just engage with us and pepper us with questions like that one and get sophisticated answers back. Cool. So we got about two minutes left. Um, let's come back over to this side. Hi. Uh, what should be added or changed to the standard development process to enhance security so it's built in and, and enhanced as much as possible during development, uh, not including the you know, external audits and things like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is a chance for all of us to plug our tools here. Um, yeah, in general, I think trying to work out like what are the properties that your code is supposed to have and the invariants that you don't think should ever be violated about it are kind of a good first step. Um, you know, we have a wealth of tools available now. We mentioned uh, in 2018 that we didn't have last year. We have static analyzers that pick out examples of incorrect code, uh, but we also have tools that allow you to prove properties about your own code. Um, so like at a, at a basic level, you should be running static analysis tools and bug finding tools like Slither or Mithril uh, early on in the development cycle. Uh, you should be thinking about what kinds of properties, uh, the spec or invariants that you'd like your code to hold, and then using tools like Echidna, Manticore, or K to actually prove that those properties hold for all the cases you think they do. Um, and then you should be engaging with experts to think so, like, you know, in, a, in an adversarial fashion about how the environment that you're executing in can affect that contract. So like whether you can be front run or not. Um, and then also uh, whether there are ways for um, people to uh, work within your system to collect you know, tokens or incentives and produce suboptimal results um, and eventually just you know, degrade the effectiveness of whatever the decentralized system it is that you've created. Um, those are some things that I think I would think about if you want to end up with a, a, a good product at the end. Write a damn spec, please, because otherwise we can have no way to understand what you think you're building. So write a spec and make it as formal as possible. Yeah, yeah I'll say again, write a spec, write a lot of specs, write specs every time your code changes. And also, 
code review with each other, make sure everyone's on the same page about what your code does, the like, huge amounts of security issues come from the fact that just people are not on the same page. Um, yeah, so Mithril, 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 Mithril. <laughs> um, you should run it, you should also run his. Uh, run a linter, I really like Solium, and like if, you, if it's enforcing like some reasonable code style, that goes much further than you might think. Um, write a lot of tests, ideally write, write a spec and then write tests and then write the code that does the thing. Um, uh, yeah, that's, I don't have anything to add at this time. Awesome, and that is all the time we have. So thank you all for being here. Um, I think we're gonna have Hudson come back out and close this out. Thanks, guys.